All right, friends. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's pull it back together. Pull it back together. Or pull it apart, I guess. We're going to pull it apart. That's what we're going to do. Turn it down a little bit. A little hot. A little hot. Three. Yeah, I'll be here all week. I'll be here all week. Just standing right on the stage, you know. Just, um, <clears throat> good to see you all. Uh, all right. A couple things, real quick. One is, last week I mentioned... Giving you all to, uh, for you all to start thinking about nominations for prospective elders and deacons. And that is going to begin next week and it'll be on the Connect card. So there will be, at the end of service, when we do our Connect card like normal, there will be a space to, to write in a name. Now, this week, I'm just going to give a two minutes or less, see how fast I can do it, explanation of deacon. And next week, I'll talk about elder, okay, just briefly, just so we know what we're looking for. New Testament church has two sort of official offices, elders, which can be pastors. Sometimes people use the word bishop, but we use the word pastor or elder here. Uh, just there, that's it's what you think. Deacons is the second office, and it means literally servant, right? I know. Everybody's going to sign up for that one. <laughs> but it, it's, I think... Uh, hands down one of the most important aspects of any healthy church is having a healthy deacon squad, man. And uh, they serve the church in all of its needs and all of its compl complexities. Uh, and I think right now we're about to hopefully install our first two with Alex and Peter, but um, we first see deacons in Acts 6, right? You remember the story when uh, there's all these, like there's widows complaining about food distribution and all this wild stuff going on and the elders are trying to, the pastors, the, the original 12 are trying to push forward the gospel and there's all this complaining stuff and they're like, ah, we don't have time. It seems a little insensitive when you just skim the service. It's like, we don't have time to wait tables. We need people to help us. So they select seven men full of the spirit and they, uh, these seven dudes like become essentially the first deacons. So when you think through deacon, I want you to think of any man or woman, right? Man or woman that is serving, just serves. Doesn't need a title, doesn't need to, a push, doesn't need you to tell them what to just, that's their heart. They just go, right? That's kind of things to think about. And there's also some qualifications. So if you look at 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, you don't have to turn there, but 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, that's where it gives qualifications for a deacon. And that's kind of what I will look through as pastor, elder, when I'm, when I'm looking at the names and kind of praying and interacting with people that are, that are nominated. That's what we'll, that's what we'll look to. Right. So begin thinking about that. And next week will be the first time that's on our connect card. And next week I'll do the same thing, but with the office of elder. OK. And then we'll hopefully get some our first nominations at the end of service next week. So. All right. That's the housekeeping. Misunderstood. Misunderstood. My very flawed but valiant effort at making another slide. Haven't done it in a while. Uh, but we're attacking our coffee cup mugs, man, our favorite verses that are on our walls on our coffee mugs and sayings we hear in the culture that are loosely at least influenced by some form of biblical truth and we're going at them. Not really. We're just trying to see if those verses on our mugs are really what we think they mean. Last week we talked about Jeremiah 29 11 and Thunga won our prize which has it arrived it was there when I got home from church of course like thanks Amazon. So, Thunga, you want to come get your prize? Give Thunga a hand clap while she comes and gets her coffee cup. This one is uh, the graduate edition. I thought it was perfect that this cup is on, like, every graduation mug you could ever get. Like, I know the thoughts I have for you, declares the Lord. So, uh, now I have some bad news, kind of, because I learned from my mistake last week. I ordered the gift for this week early. I was, I've been waiting on Amazon all week. I've been checking, looking for status, and it never went to ship. It never went to ship, and I'm like, this is, I'm getting a little nervous now. It's Thursday. Friday, nothing. Still hasn't shipped. Yesterday, they finally sent me an email like, we're not sure where your package is. We're gonna, I'm like, are you kidding me, man? Like, what in the world? So I don't even have the prize for this week either. <laughs> I was willing to take the wrap for last week. This week, man, it had the little prime and the check through it. You know, It was like, you're going to be here in a day. It said tomorrow been a lot of tomorrows since I ordered it okay so but we're still gonna do it and hopefully you'll have it next week I don't this one hasn't even shipped I don't know where it is we're still gonna do it 
There's this verse in the Bible that everybody quotes for a lot of different reasons. Let's see if anybody knows the chapter and verse. You ready for your quiz today? For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Anybody know that? No one wins the prize. What, you said 10, no one? We got Matthew something and Matthew 10. Matthew 10, Matthew 10 was the closest. We had Gospels somewhere in Matthew and Matthew 10. It's none, so, so uh, maybe this one isn't on as many coffee mugs as I thought. <laughs> maybe no one's ever seen. The, anyway, it's Matthew 18, uh, Matthew 18, 20. So, Kevin, the Campbells will take home the prize if it ever comes. It is a nice little wall hanging, 11 by 14, that has this on it and some, like, dandelions fading away. It's all in black and white. I think you'll enjoy it. Or you won't, but don't tell me. Matthew 18, that's where we'll be today. Let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to Matthew 18. We will have the verses on here. It's five verses, Matthew 18, 15 to 20. But we're going to talk about what I think is some really cool things, and I hope by the end of it it's encouraging, although it could not be. (laughs) But what we're going to do is hopefully make this encouraging. See, Matthew 18, 20, most times you hear it, it's like in a prayer meeting, right? It's like, oh, where two or three are gathered, here is the Lord. It's usually like pastors say that to get people fired up when like three people show up for prayer meetings. It's like, but where two or three are gathered, the Lord is with us. Other people use this verse to justify not being in a local body, right? There's two or three gathered in my living room. We're at church. That's not what it means either. Now, like last week, there's always some underlying truths to this, right? Like, Jesus is always with you, right? If you are a believer, if God has saved you, Jesus is always with you. He promises that in Matthew 28, I will be with you always to the end of the age. He gives us his Holy Spirit. He is in us, working through us, working in us. There's some truth to that. So obviously, when two or three people gather together, Jesus is with them. When you're in your closet by yourself crying out to the Lord, he's with you there too. So we have to be careful not to pigeonhole the scripture because what does that mean? If two or three have to be gathered for his presence to be with us, when I'm praying alone, he's not with me. He doesn't hear me. He's not for me. See, there's some underlying truth there, but this scripture doesn't mean any of those things. This scripture is actually written in the context of church discipline. Don't hear that one preached very often. But it's true. And I think that's why it's important. Because next time you hear somebody shout out, where two or three are gathered, there's some truth to that, but that's not why that was written. So let's talk about that. Matthew 18 in general is really a chapter on Christian living in Christian community. Christian living in Christian community. He addresses what it means to be great, right? Disciples go, who's great in the kingdom? How you're great? You're great by serving. He addresses temptation. He addresses the very popular and rightfully so parable of the lost sheep. He leaves the 99 to get the one. And then what we're going to talk about is what he talks about if a brother or sister sins against you. And right after this, he talks about how often, how frequently, how many times you have to forgive a brother or sister if they sin against you. So let's pray. Let's get into Matthew 18, 15 to 20. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just pray that this would build us up, not tear us down. That this would encourage us and not leave us sad. But God, that your word would produce fruit in our lives, produce understanding in our minds, and produce a love for you and for one another in our hearts. Bless my speech, bless our hearing, bless our gathering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's get into it. Matthew 18, 15a. I've separated verse 15 into two Sort of uh, mini verses for now, and you'll see why. It reads like this. If your brother sins against you, pause. I know, it's abrupt. If your brother sins against you, our first carryout is going to be based solely on that text. Man, how many of you all know that Christians can sin against you? Like the church, people in the church, your brothers and sisters can, can hurt you. It's a present reality. That's our first carryout. Christians might sin against one another. I don't like the word might here, but I didn't want to use may because I don't want it to seem like it's it's a permission. Like they may, like may or may not, they might, but not they may, not like you're allowed to. You shouldn't do that. But Christians might sin against one another. And that's hard. 
Raise your hand if you know anybody who has walked away from the faith or walked away from the church because someone in the church did them great harm. I see almost every hand up. So more than 50%, probably about 65, 70% of the people here today know a person personally who has walked away from Jesus or walked away from the faith because of how hurt they've been by other Christians. Now, I think part of that is answered in this, these few verses. But I also think there's an element of it that's because of our expectations, especially when we're younger in faith. We sometimes can have the expectation that when I walk into a church, it's completely free of sinful people. It's completely free of any ill will or intention, anybody that's being said, everybody's perfect when you walk in these doors. But the reality is we all were hopeless, sinful people that Christ is redeemed and is redeeming and sanctifying. And we still have some of these things that we're working out. We're still being sanctified. It's very easy for someone you love dearly, that you fellowship with regularly to hurt you. Now, I would hope and pray that that pain, that that hurt doesn't come intentionally. If the pain and hurt comes intentionally, there's some things that need to be addressed. Like, obviously, need to be addressed. But, whether, but if, even if the pain is unintentional, it still needs to be addressed, and that's what this text is all about. So let me ask you another question. How many of you, if someone sins against you, know a person, someone sinned against someone you know, didn't go to the person and talk to them. So less hands, but still somewhere floating around the 40 to 50% mark. The tendency is most people are conflict avoiders, right? I have a degree, two, in, two degrees in conflict resolution, and there is a, a strategy of conflict resolution. I know some CADR people in the house, okay, yeah. Uh, conflict resolution, there's a strategy of conflict resolution called avoidance. Like you will avoid a conflict for a little while strategically and then go back to it to address it when, really when you can get the upper hand. Don't do that. But what we tend to do is avoid conflict altogether. Johnny hurt me. Ah, you tell everybody else, but you never talk to Johnny because we avoid conflict. And what we, by default, do is typically produce more conflict by telling more people. So what we're doing is recruiting people to be on our side, recruiting people to co-sign our hurt and our justification in doing any number of things. But what this scripture is going to address is the proper response is to address sinful behavior. So our first carryout, Christians might sin against one another. I think having that perspective can help avoid some things in the future. Having the perspective, not, not like you're walking on eggshells or you're paranoid all the time, but like, hey, I know that I could sin against somebody and somebody could sin against me. It's a reality. It could happen. Let's go to 15b, or the second part of verse 15. So if your brother sins against you, go, tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So what do you do if your brother or sister sins against you? Go and tell them their fault. You know how many times I've tried to resolve conflict with people who one party harmed another and the party that did the harm had no idea they did it? You ever known somebody like that? Like you, you hear about this thing that happens and you talk to them like, I had no idea I hurt them. So we can have people walking around hurt, really hurt and justifiably so and they'll see the person across the room just living life loving every day partying with the party animals and have no idea the great harm that they've caused their brother or sister now sometimes they know but sometimes people don't 
I think what we don't often do when we're hurt because we feel the weight of that is give people the benefit of the doubt. Like maybe they didn't do that on purpose. And the thing about addressing it with the person alone, right? Let's talk about an individual addressing an individual about something that they see in their life. Now, there is some debate on whether this is like, you know, you see Johnny going out, you know, doing something he shouldn't be doing, and you just go and address him. That's, that's one application of it. And another one, but this is talking about if a brother offends you, if they did something to you going to them and telling them their fault. What happens when you address it one-on-one is you, you really do find out if it was intentional or not. You really do find out if they were throwing shade or if they were just living their life and had no idea you were just a standby, uh, uh, casualty, of, casualty of war, you know? What we learn from the rest of this, right, he talks about two or three witnesses. If he doesn't listen to you one-on-one, go with a couple people. This is drawing from the law of Moses where a testimony was confirmed by two or three witnesses, right? So it's like, hey, Johnny does you great harm. There's no Johnny's in here, is there? Johnny does you great harm, and you go to Johnny. You're like, Johnny, Johnny be good. You see what I did there? Johnny's been bad. You address Johnny. Johnny don't listen to you. Johnny continues in his behavior, so you go grab Luke and Susie, and you're like, you saw what Johnny did, right? Yeah, let's go talk to Johnny. So you go up to Johnny and the three of you. It's a small group now. It's like, hey, Johnny, Johnny, be good. Your behavior, it's inappropriate. You're causing harm. And now you're causing harm to more than just one. You're causing harm to a group. We need you to change your ways, Johnny. We love you. Johnny, don't listen to the three of you all. So it says go take it to the church. Go put it before the congregation. Johnny, be good. Johnny, still don't listen. And then it's stage four. It's excommunication. Treat Johnny as a tax collector, an unbeliever. Johnny is no longer at that point to be considered a brother or sister in Christ because they've proven time and time again they're unrepentant in their sin. They're not willing to change. Followers of Jesus don't do that. They don't do that to one another. They don't do that to the church. They don't do that to Christ. So what we see here is really four stages of church discipline. And now when we hear things like discipline, it's hard. We talked about in Hebrews how discipline is painful for a little while, right? But it reaps a harvest, right? It reaps a harvest, a peaceful fruit of righteousness for all who are trained by it, remember, in Hebrews. It also says that when Jesus is disciplining us, when God is disciplining us, he's giving us, imparting to us essentially his holiness. He's making us into his image. All of those things, both of those things are methods and means to get you to a place where you've been called to be. They're modes of restoration. See, discipline is a mode of restoration. The point of church discipline is not to call somebody out on their sin and leave them hanging. The purpose of church discipline in all of its stages is to call out sinful behavior and restore that person to a place of honor. We see in Galatians 6.1, when we talk to Galatians, one of my favorite scriptures, and I really feel from the bottom of my heart that if we as churches cultivated an atmosphere in our gatherings and in our bodies that lived out Galatians 6.1, we would have way less problem with sin and we would have way less problem with unforgiveness, sinfulness, bitterness. And Galatians 6.1 is, if anyone is caught in trespass, you who are spiritual, restore that person with a spirit of gentleness. So the point of calling out sin or holding someone accountable for their sinful behavior in the end is what? Restoration. It's the same with church discipline. These four stages, you have an individual approach, one-on-one, that's the first stage. Oftentimes I have found in pastoral ministry that someone will come to me and be like, Johnny did this X, Y, Z, can you believe that? And I'm like, oh man, that's terrible. Did you talk to him? No, I want you to talk to him. Well, that's not what the Bible says. You go talk to him. And when you don't get anywhere, if you don't get anywhere talking to him, then come back and we'll talk about it. That's not usually our first step. So we have individual, small group, church, and excommunication. Now, a a brief word on, on excommunication. That too, it seems harsh, but that too is a mode of restoration. We see in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 5, he addresses a man who is in some wicked behavior with his stepmom. It's real gross. 
And Paul's like, you all are giving this dude a thumbs up, just letting him pass for this. No, put him out. Put him out from among you. Don't allow him to gather with you. This person is unrepentant. They won't change. We need the devil to have his way with his flesh so that his soul might be saved. It's not like throw him out on the street and never talk to him again. Throw him out on the street and hope that the devil just has his way and they end up busted and broken on the side of the road somewhere. It's never that. It's like, hey, we've addressed this guy. We've talked to him. We've prayed for him. We've loved on him. We've begged him. We've come together as a body. We've asked him, please stop this behavior. The only choice after that is Paul's like, maybe, just maybe if the devil has his way with this flesh, maybe, maybe his soul might be saved. Maybe if his flesh gets in a little pain, his soul might still be saved. Maybe he'll come back into the fold. And guess what we see in the scriptures in 2 Corinthians? That brother's restored. Back in the fold. Back in the body. So any mode and method of church discipline is to the end that the person might be restored, healthy, and whole. Walking with the body, walking with Jesus, and living out the commands of Christ. So that leads us to our second carryout of the day. There is a process for church discipline. There's a process. I think that this is one of the most neglected aspects of church in our culture. I think it's why people have such unhealthy relationships uh, with the church and with Christ and why we have such uh, churches that can be so frankly, deluded sometimes with the gospel, right? Because we're not, we're not living the life. We're not holding people accountable the way that Christ commands us. I mean, you got to think, Jesus is telling them the steps they need to take should someone sin against them. It's not a lot of guesswork that he's leaving. He's saying, this is how you address it. This is what you do. How many of you have seen in your churches this type of thing encouraged when someone has harmed another person? Honestly, when someone has harmed another person. I will say the church I was a part of years ago, I never one time saw it. Never. And when things were addressed, it just was swept. When things, were, things happened, it was just swept under the rug. No one talked about it. And people got really hurt. Now, the hope is you don't have to do any of this, right? Like, the hope is, like, we don't have people just clawing at each other, biting at each other, harming one another, so we don't have to walk through processes of restoration and processes of healing. Like, the hope is that we don't do this stuff to one another, but, like, we're people. People can be messy. Some, I can be messy sometimes. I know that I have every ability to do harm to any one of you. Like, I'm aware of that, Right? I could harm you. I can promise you I would never harm you on purpose. I would never do something to spitefully hurt you. Ever. Never. I would never do that to you. So if I do something to harm you, I come and talk to me about it. I guarantee you it wasn't intentional. Right? And I hope that we would take that position toward one another as well. To always give one another the benefit of the doubt. Like, man, I'm pretty positive like, I know, you know, I know Kevin, you know. I know Eric. I know Jasmine and Lucas. Like, they would never do that on purpose. They probably don't even know. You all didn't do anything to me. They, they probably don't even know they did it. So by going to someone and say, hey, man, when you said that thing, like, it really hurt. You know, it really, it really damaged me. And I don't even know if, I mean... Can we talk about that? And sometimes there's greater things, right? There's, there, there are intent, there's things, there's, there's adulteries, and there's all kinds of stuff, right? And those have to be addressed, too. And you don't accidentally do that, right? But you've got to give one another the benefit of the doubt, at least at first, and address conflict one-on-one. -on -one. Just talk about it, okay? There's a process for it. Somebody just doesn't commit a sinful act, and then we just throw them out. Like, get out of here. Never want to see you again. He then, that's not, that's not what Jesus commands us to do, right? All right, 
Now we're going to get to the, uh, the coffee cup verse, okay? So it is in that context that Jesus says what's next. Start in verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. There I am among them. I think the first thing we need to talk about is binding and loosing. Right? This is a favorite of some folks. Bind it up in Jesus' name and cast it out. I don't, I, that's not what he's talking about. Can you do that in Jesus' name? Sure, absolutely. I do believe that. But that's not what this is talking about. We should think of binding and loosing as declaring forbidden or permitted. Right? That's what it's talking about. He talks about this earlier in Matthew 16. He talks about the same thing when he's talking to Peter. He talks about binding and loosing. He's just talking about what you permit on earth will be, uh, is permitted in heaven. What you, we, I said that backwards. What you forbid is forbidden in heaven. What you permit is permitted in heaven. Here's the thing about that. We're not, uh, see, it's the church's responsibility to declare what conduct is, con- conduct is forbidden and what conduct is permitted. We shouldn't understand this as like forcing God into a decision, right? We're not binding and loosing things that like are not here. Like we're not like, oh, you know, I just, we're making up the rules as we go, guys. Like we're just going to figure this out. We're going to bind it up and loose it. So whatever we feel, we're going to fly on a whim and figure it out. That's wrong. We should see this as being responsive to what God has already stated, right? God has already called certain things unpermissible. So in Corinth, in, Corinth, in that story in 1 Corinthians 5, a man has taken his father's wife, his stepmom, to be his. That's gross and not permitted. And the church was just allowing them to come and keep gathering in the body. And he's like, no, that's gross and it's not permitted, Stop it. And if he doesn't stop it, they need to leave. These are things that adultery is something God has already forbidden. We're just agreeing with heaven when we bind and loose. We're agreeing with heaven. We're not making new rules. I like the example in John 20, 22 to 23. Jesus Uh, has just given his disciples the Holy Spirit, and he says, if you forgive the sins of many, they're forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Their decisions are being guided by the Holy Spirit. And so in this case, he's saying church discipline should be guided by the Holy Spirit. It should be guided by what heaven has declared already. You should be forbidding conduct that the Bible forbids and permitting conduct that the Bible permits. Then he says, if two or three agree on earth, anything they ask, the Father will grant it. Now, here's one of those others, kind of the sub verse of this Matthew 18, 20, where there's some truth here. But again, we have to read it in its context. It's not saying what I'm what I'm not saying is that if you ask for something, he's not saying if you ask for something in Jesus name, the father won't give it to you. What I am saying is you don't have to have two or three to do that. And, that, and he's not talking about general prayer at this point. He's talking about the prayer for the person. Right? He just says if your brother sins against you. So he's talking about in the context of people sinning against you and going to them. Remember, two or three have already gathered and gone to approach this person. And now he's saying if you bind, if you permit, I forgot the other word. If you permit or forbid, I don't use the word forbidden. I don't know. If you permit or forbid, if you forebode something, I don't know if that's a word. If you forbid or permit something, And you have agreed on that, and you pray that God would help this brother see his ways. And you're praying for their restoration. You're praying that God would open their eyes to the realities of their sin and their behavior. If you do this, my Father will grant it. And that's when he gets to verse 20, 
Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. He's saying when you all agree on this matter, on matters like this, when you agree that someone is out of line, that someone isn't conducting himself, when you've come together, when you've gone through the process, when you've gone steps one, steps two, steps three, and unfortunately if you have to push the brother or sister out and say, let the devil have his way with him so that their soul might be restored. He's saying, if you all are in agreement on this, if you all know and have gone through the process that I've laid out for you, I am with you also. So our next carryout is Jesus affirms church discipline. And I put a little note in mind that says done properly. He affirms it when done properly. Jesus is saying, if you all have done this the right way, the way I have prescribed, if you've gone through these steps, I'm with you in it. Heaven is with you in it. Why? Because it's not new. It's not original. He told us. We're just doing it his way. Jesus affirms church discipline when it's done properly. Now, that may not sound super encouraging because we've just spent, you know, the last 25 minutes or whatever talking about church discipline and what's going to happen if mammoths wild out. Okay? But here's why it's encouraging. Anytime that God is with you on something, Anytime that God is, heaven is in, we're in agreement with heaven on something, it lifts the burden. It lifts the burden off the individuals. See, any of you who would talk to one another about someone sinning against you, that's not easy. But God is with you. Any small group of people that would go confront someone in their sin, it's not easy. But God is with you. God forbid if we ever had to address it in front of a larger group, in front of the church context, that would not be easy. But God is with you. And I pray no one ever has to be put out, but if that had to happen, if we had to treat that person like they weren't a believer anymore, that would be awful, heartbreaking, gut-wrenching. People would not understand, but God would be with you in the decision. And that would be important because we, everything we do, whether it's outreach to the community, whether it's preaching here on Sundays or having kids ministry and what we teach in there or anything that we do as a church, what is our goal, our mission? Love God, love people, make disciples. Everything we do, we follow by this book. Everything we do, at least in some way, we should be able to justify with the Bible. Because if we can't justify it with the Scripture, why are we doing it? It doesn't even mean it's a bad thing, but we're just wasting our time. The things we're supposed to do are right here. We have our marching orders. Go make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always to the end of the age. So it's important in something as hard and difficult as church discipline that we be on Jesus' side in what we're doing. See, people have abused, you talk about people abusing the scripture to say things it doesn't. People have abused church discipline to do things that it's not for. Churches have abused church discipline to make people conform to the, to the pastor's image or to things that the church wants to do. You ever seen, it's kind of funny, but it's, it's also not. You ever seen those uh, things, those pictures floating around the internet of people receiving um, letters in the mail? from like the elders or deacon boards for like, for not, for not giving. Like you're, you're in disobedience and you need to like, you're not giving. So you don't, you're going to have to be, it's like, wow, that's one way to, to address something. Like that's not, you know, there's other ways to address generosity than sending a letter home. Like if you don't, it's like a ransom. If you don't give your money to the church now, we're taking you off the membership list. <laughs> Like, I think they're probably leaving anyway at this point. I don't know about that. Most people don't respond well to that. But church discipline done right is ordained and blessed by God. And again, I just want to reemphasize, the last thing I'm going to say today, and we're going to go to our carryouts, is the point of all of this is not discipline for discipline's sake. It's the same reason I discipline my kids, which we talked about with Hebrews. I discipline my kids so that they will grow up into productive adults godly men and women. Christ disciplines us to conform us to his image, to make us more like him, so that we have a peaceful fruit of righteousness in our lives. And church discipline comes for what? The same purpose, restoration, repentance and restoration. If Jesus calls us to repentance and restoration and a brother or sister is sinning or sinned against us, the purpose of any kind of confrontation, and I use that term loosely, 
This should be done in love, like Galatians 6 says, with a spirit of gentleness. It's not for the sake of calling out or shaming or making people feel bad. It's for the sake of saying, I, you're doing me great harm. You're doing our body great harm. And we want to see you restored and walking healthy and whole in all of the things God has for your life. That's the purpose of church discipline. So let's go to our next steps. Uh, go ahead and hit that QR code. You can fill out your name and info if you haven't already. Even if you have already, do it again. Uh, how we can pray for you. You can follow along with our next steps. A number of different things on there for you to check. What team you may want to be a part of. If you need to be baptized, membership class, those kind of things. So next step A is to reflect. How have you responded when sinned against? How have you responded personally if someone has sinned against you or someone's done you harm? Just reflect on that. How have you done that in the past? Do you think you responded effectively? Do you think you responded um, the right way? you think you could have done better? Did you respond, most importantly, the way that Jesus calls us to respond? Because listen here, this is a little footnote in my notes, and I just want to tell you this. The next thing Jesus talks about after this, the disciples are kind of baffled by this. And the next thing Peter says, uh, that said in, in verse 21, it says, Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will I forgive uh, my brother who sins against me? How often should I forgive him? As many as seven times. In the popular scripture, Jesus says, no, 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 I tell you 70 times seven. In other words, for, forgive him as many times as he comes to you. That's a hard word. And here's what Jesus says by the end of this. He gives this parable, right? Mine calls it the parable of the unforgiving servant. And it's about a guy who uh, has these debts and he goes to collect them. Or he, he, sorry, somebody comes to collect a debt from him and they forgive him of his debt. Well, he goes to collect debts from some other people that owe him and he will not forgive their debts and has them bound up and put in prison. And you know what the last thing Jesus says in this? He's, he's unforgiving. He was forgiven, but he won't forgive. This is the last thing Jesus says. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servants as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. The debt that the man owed, he could never have paid in a lifetime. The other people owed him very insignificant debts, and he would not forgive them. That shows the importance of forgiving one another. So how have you responded when sinned against? Is your posture, doesn't mean you don't have pain, doesn't mean you just let people slide, it just means confronting one another, how we've been harmed, and having a posture that's bent towards forgiveness, even in pain, right? Doesn't mean there's not a process of healing, doesn't mean you just let them walk all over you and do it again, it just means your, 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 pot, your disposition needs to be more towards the side of forgiveness than, than unforgiveness. Because unforgiveness leads us back into chains, not them. Next step B. Do I even have, yeah. If someone has sinned against you currently, make a plan to talk to them. This is dangerous, but it's what we got to do, all right? If someone has sinned against you, make a plan to talk to them. I just saw this lived out in real time. With somebody that I know, there was an issue. It needed to be addressed. They addressed it with the person, one-on-one, -on -one, and it was resolved. It's beautiful. So make a plan. If you need help with a plan, how you talk to them, what are you supposed to say, what are you supposed to do, talk to me. We can help you walk through it, but make a concrete plan, when you can talk to them, how you can talk to them. There's certain things like your body position, your language, not being you know, overly accusatory, but using language that's very passive, uh, not passive, but uh, de-escalating. So anyway, next step, C. Read these scriptures. There's a lot of them. There's three of them. Uh, read Matthew 18, 15 to 20 again. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5 is that one I referenced where they, where they uh, excommunicate the brother. And then uh, for 2 Corinthians 2, 5 to 11, you see that person restore, back in the, in the fold. All right, let's pray. Everybody can go get their kiddos. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that even as we talk about things like church discipline, Lord, that we would understand that you are a God who loves us and uh, and has restored us 
is restoring us? And should we find ourselves on the wrong side of, of something, God, you hope that we would restore one another? I pray that we do have a spirit of gentleness here. We would see your word for what it is, God, that you agree when we do things your way, that you're with us when we do things your way. I pray that this church would never have to enter into some kind of church discipline. I pray that we would never have to be a church that, um, that has these difficulties. But, Lord, I know where there's people and where there's pain and where there's traumas and where there's feelings, Lord, sometimes things go awry. I pray that we would always have the disposition toward one another that we would never harm one another. I hope that we would always have the disposition toward one another of forgiveness, that we wouldn't even dream about doing harm to one of our brothers or sisters, or anybody for that matter. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us. Lord, your gospel has set us free to live like you, and you would never do us harm. Lord, lead us not into any temptation, and keep us delivered from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, the church said Amen. Amen. See y'all next week. Go get your kiddos. Don't forget your security tags.